All right, so I guess we're good to go. Thanks for coming to the first of this case studies class. Um, if you haven't already seen uh, Dr. Jack Payne's introduction to the course, it's not every course that gets an introduction from Senior VP for Research, so we're going to go ahead and, and show that now. So just enjoy. Well, hello, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today and talk about a topic near and dear to my heart. It's something very concerning to all of us who work at public research universities. And that is, there is an attack on science today on many different topics. For example, evolution, sea level rise, climate change, vaccinations for our children, and GMOs. In every one of those cases, there is no scientific evidence that supports the stands against them. Humankind has invented the scientific method to try to figure out what truth is. And unless you believe in crystal balls or palm reading, there is no better way to seek truth. Is science perfect? No, nothing is. But the beauty of science is that it has the ability to correct itself. The more you repeat experiments, the more you establish a body of truth, the gold standard being a publication of your results and conclusions in academic journals after your work is through rigorous review by your peers. Now, when I say science is under siege, I don't mean just criticism. In 2015, I took a call from the FBI's Domestic Terrorism Task Force investigating threats against one of our own professors. Apparently what made him the target of a threat were his efforts to publicly communicate the benefits of biotechnology. Now, things turned out okay, and you'll see for yourself because that professor is one of your instructors for this course. The larger point is this. When solid science does not yield the results that people hope for, they not only reject the conclusions, they question the integrity of the scientific community, dismiss solid science as just another point of view. Discredit the people who spend long, solitary hours following the evidence wherever it leads. This siege is dangerous to our democracy and to our notion of progress. In the coming weeks, you'll become familiar with four examples of how much scientific literacy matters and how it's sometimes ignored. Part of me is very frustrated that we still have to debate what I considered long settled questions. Questions like, is climate change really happening? Will GMO food make you sick? Do vaccines cause autism? We need scientific literacy because the naysayers want to muddle science as a way to make the case to do nothing. And when they succeed, we drag our feet instead of taking action that can save money, our environment, and even our lives. As we march toward a day when climate change's worst effects become irreversible, a U.S. Senator takes a snowball into the Capitol and holds it up as so-called proof that climate change is a hoax. We hold back technology that could feed so many more mouths in a world where 3.1 million children die of starvation each year. And we get parents refusing to vaccinate their children because of a retracted 18-year-old journal article. That you've even enrolled in this course is a good sign that you're interested in truth based on evidence instead of ideology. You've taken a very important step to inform yourself not only on these issues, but on how science in general works in the real world. I urge you to think deeply and ask questions. Those questions can point the way toward establishing new truth or changing what we currently hold to be true. What shouldn't happen is that evidence gets shouted down or characterized as a guess because there's a 1% chance it might be wrong. Marsha McNutt, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, put it this way. Science is not a body of facts. Science is a method for deciding whether what we choose to believe has a basis in the laws of nature or not. Once you've completed this class, I hope it reminds you for the rest of your life of the importance of paying heed to science. And by that, I mean knowledge that's been generated by a truly scientific community, not by clerics, not by industry, and not by activists. 
I won't be around to witness the worst effects of climate change, but you might. Or maybe you'll be around to see how the world rallied around the cause of its own salvation and took the action necessary to fend off environmental apocalypse. People like you who inform themselves and speak up for truth make it more likely that the latter scenario will play out. Whether you intend to pursue a career in science or not, it'll be worth it to apply yourself in this course. You'll be faced with so many choices, who to vote for, what to feed your kids, what to buy, how to care for your bodies, and even your minds. You won't be able to do independent research to inform your every decision. The best you can do is hone your ability to identify sources of evidence-backed information. I hope that this course will help you distinguish a true scientific community from sources of information driven by ideology, faith, or profit. Scientific literacy gives you a better shot to have your actions produce the consequences you were looking for. In short, to live the life that you intend. I commend you for enrolling in this course. I hope you'll emerge from it with your own ideas about which voices speak mostly with volume and which ones speak with something much closer to wisdom. Thank you. All right, thanks for your attention. Um, and it was a great introduction to what we're trying to accomplish in this course. Um, I just want to you know, underline a couple of the points that Jack made. You know, really, at least for the next four weeks, now I can't speak to the other instructors that will be coming through, but at least for the next four weeks, definitely I, I, I really want to challenge you to think deeply and raise questions and concerns as much as you can. Because this class is really about you, your understanding, your engagement with the material. And the more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Um, if, so in class, if you're here and you want to raise questions, you have a concern, you disagree with something I said, you don't understand something I said, please just interrupt me. I can handle it. I'm OK with it. So you guys can interrupt me whenever you want. Um, if you're not able to be here, if you're taking the class online, We'll have an online discussion. I will be on that online discussion, at least for the part on evolution, maybe for the other parts as well. Um, so try to create as much of a dialogue uh, with your community of peers as you can. I'll definitely be there to interact with you online and here in person. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over what we're going to cover in the next four weeks. And then we'll just jump into the first sort of bit of material. So the first four weeks is on evolution. Um, and this is basically what we're going to do. We're going to do like the website says and teach the controversy. We're going to figure out what is evolutionary theory, what are the basic concepts that have gone into evolutionary theory, and where did they come from? What aspects of evolutionary theory are sort of globally accepted, both by evolutionary biologists, those that support the theory of evolution, and those who are critical of evolution? Because there's a, there's a lot of evolutionary theory that is accepted pretty much universally. And so we're going to identify what those pieces of evolutionary theory are. Um, and then we're going to go into the controversy. So what parts of evolutionary theory do different people disagree with? What are the, the issues or concerns or questions that people have raised when they start to criticize evolutionary theory? And, 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 and where does that come from? Of course, as part of that, we're going to come in, we're going to come across alternatives to evolution. So it's easy to sort of criticize something and say, well, this isn't perfect, this isn't perfect, this isn't perfect. But what attempts have been made to construct something that tries to explain the same things that evolutionary theory does, but using a different conceptual framework? And then finally, uh, what does the evidence suggest? How are we going to differentiate between evolutionary theory and alternatives to evolutionary theory? And what sort of evidence can we bring to bear to try to make up our own minds about what's actually going on in the world? So rather than sort of go topic by topic through these four weeks, we're going to take sort of a combined approach and we're going to hit on a lot of these issues in each of the lectures. And we're going to try to go from a more shallow understanding deeper and deeper as we go. So this is week one. Um, again, like I said, we're going to try to cover a lot of the different, different topics, but we're going to focus for this first week on life and biodiversity. <coughs> 
And the reason I'm starting here is because if you've taken intro to biology, or if you've looked up the Wikipedia article on biology, you probably come across something that says biology is the study of life, right? And that's typically if somebody asks me on the street, you know, you're a biologist, what's biology? Well, we always study life. We study living things, right? So that obviously raises the question then, you know, what is life? You, know, you say you study life, well, what is that? What are the defining characteristics that make something living versus non-living? And we're going to try to build up a sort of working definition of life, starting with sort of an intuitive understanding, and then see, once we have a, a sort of feel uh, for what types of things we think are alive and what types of things we think are not alive, like how can we formalize that into a definition of life? so that we can know what we should go out and look and, and study, right? So with all definitions, you know, we're trying to place a conceptual framework on top of a world that doesn't necessarily know much about human conceptual frameworks. And so there are going to be things, no matter what our definition comes up with, th sort of things that are obviously alive, that we go, yeah, you see something, you go, yeah, that's alive, no question. Also, no matter what our definition turns out to be, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's obviously not alive. Yeah, we know that's not alive. And then there's the stuff in the middle, the ambiguous stuff, the stuff that kind of matches the definition and kind of doesn't match the definition. And any definition of you know, any phenomenon that we try to come up with is always going to fit this sort of pattern. There's stuff that obviously fits the definition, there's stuff that obviously doesn't, and there's some fuzzy stuff in the middle. Everybody okay with that? All right, so let's try to just fill this in with sort of some basic intuition. So most people would put animals like a mouse, they're alive, right? Anybody have a, I mean, not like we can determine truth by voting, but anybody have a big problem with that? Probably not, okay. You know, plants too, definitely alive. Um, you know, back in the day we didn't know about microbes, but bacteria and fungi, most biologists, most members of the general public would generally agree that they're alive, right? Okay, so we've, we, we kind of have an intuitive understanding of what living things are kind of like. Not alive, you know, rocks, not really living, cars, not many people would think that their car was alive. You know, some people kind of get attached to their cars, but still, probably not alive. Um, an interesting one, crystals, which grow, when they start off small and they get bigger, they can respond to changes in their environment, but we still kind of think, no, not really alive. Even though they have some of the characteristics of living things, you know, probably not alive. Another interesting example is fire, which we generally think, you know, not really alive, even though it catabolizes, so it takes in food, it breaks it down, it produces waste, it grows, has some of the characteristics that we might attribute to living things, but, you know, generally we think is not alive. So those types of things we classify as not alive. And then there's sort of the ambiguous stuff, so one that's often thought of in biology circles is viruses. They have a lot of the characteristics that we would attribute to life, but they have some characteristics that we think maybe they're, they're not alive. So they use so much of the cellular machinery to work that maybe they're not independent organisms. So throw them in the ambiguous category. Kind of alive, kind of not alive. We're not really sure. There's some controversy there maybe. So that's sort of at least my intuitive understanding of, you know, what is alive, what isn't alive, what do we not really know about. So I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to sort of look at NASA astrobiology. Now why would I look at this? So NASA astrobiology is sort of a group of researchers, scientists, and engineers whose job it is to find life, mostly on other planets. So they spend a lot of time studying the basic characteristics of life and trying to understand what, which of those characteristics 
are expected to be universal, that have to be there for life to exist, and which of them are kind of particular to a certain type of life, maybe life that evolved on this planet or that arose on this planet is very different from life that arose on another planet. And so what do we expect to see of anything that's alive? And so they do this from time to time, but this happens to be from 1994. They got together and tried to figure out, like, how can we define life? Because we have to find it. So we need to know what it is we're looking for. So they tried a lot of different definitions with a lot of different problems. And finally, this is what they came up with. Life is a self-sustaining chemical system that's capable of Darwinian evolution. And I said, holy cannoli, Batman, because a bunch of really smart people whose job it is to figure out what life is put Darwinian evolution as the defining characteristic of life. So that's pretty deep, because this definition is saying that chemistry plus evolution is life. So the only difference between biology and chemistry is the evolutionary process. So that tells me that, at least in this interpretation, evolution is really central to biology. So I'll go back to another famous essay uh, from Dobzhansky in 1973. This is actually the title of the essay. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so if we go back to this definition of life, we can go, yeah. I mean, we can't even define our subject of study without appealing to evolutionary theory. So yeah, evolution is central to all of biology. And if there, is, if there are major problems with evolutionary theory, this is a big deal because it forces us to rethink the entire enterprise of biological inquiry. So we really need to understand evolution to understand biology. <coughs> so I'm going to take another step back and think back to like the 1800s when there were naturalists. I don't know, maybe there are still naturalists. But back in the 1800s, naturalists, you know, we had beards and we walked around in nature and looked at things. So these naturalists, back in the day, noticed two critical things about the world that they were trying to observe and catalog. And these questions are questions that are still central to biological study. So what did they notice? The first thing they noticed was that there are all kinds of different types of living things. Now at the time, you know, maybe we didn't have microscopes, we didn't know about microorganisms or viruses or stuff like that, but they, you could see plants and you could see animals and you could see that there were lots of different types of things. You know, there were snakes that didn't have legs, there were fish that could swim underwater and breathe underwater, there were birds that flew, there were, you know, crawly things with hair, there were worms, there's all kinds of different stuff. Um, you know, there were giant trees, there are grasses, there are mosses, there are all kinds of different plants and animals. So why are there so many different kinds of plants and animals? Like, how did this diversity come to be? And we're still trying to answer this question. And the other thing that they noticed, that even though there was this crazy diversity of life, all these different living things running around, well, some of them were sessile, um, there were really obvious similarities among some of these different organisms, right? So you look at a snake that doesn't have any legs, but it has the same sort of skull and the same sort of bone structure as uh, a lizard that has legs, or a mouse that has legs, or a fish that swims in the water. You know, they all share these certain characteristics. So even though there are all these different types of organisms running around, there were really obvious similarities. And so how did these similarities come about? So now we have these two sort of opposing things that we're trying to explain, the diversity of living things and their similarities. And so here's just a little picture that describes some of the similarities and differences um, among, in this case, just vertebrate animals. So you can just look at these pictures and you can see that there are similarities among these different cartoon animals. And there are differences. You know, rabbits and primates both have fur. 
you know, you look at crocodiles, amphibians, and primates, and, and rodents, and they all have four legs. They all have similar uh, skeletal structures, right? So they're similar, and they're different. And so evolution, at its core, is the idea that we can explain both the similarities among different organisms and their differences with three words. This is pretty small. Descent with modification. So remember those three words, descent with modification. You're going to remember them by the end of the day. And so there's lots of sort of bells and whistles around evolutionary theory. You know, we know a lot more today than we did in the 1800s. We know what DNA is. We know what genes are. We know how mutations happen. We know a lot more about the mechanism. But at its core idea, evolution explains both the similarities and differences among organisms by descent with modification. And again, we'll get into the details and stuff later on. But basically, you can think that you know, descent does a, goes a long way to explaining similarities. right? So things are similar because there was a common ancestor that had some certain trait, in this case, vertebrae. And then all of the descendants of that ancestor inherited that trait. And things are different because at different points in their history, they changed. So you get an amniotic egg here, and you get the evolution of hair here. And so you get these differences arising as time progresses. And so really, again, just to make you remember this, you can almost define the core idea of evolutionary biology as descent with modification. Three words that explain the similarities and differences among organisms. So what do we need? Now, if, what, what would we need to produce this idea of descent with modification? It turns out that we need to start with a couple things. First of all, we need to have some sort of variation among organisms in a population. So if you look around you, you can see that people have different heights, different hair colors. There's, there are differences among all of us. And so in this sort of fictitious population of beetles, there's an obvious difference. Well, there's actually two differences you can see here. They're different in size, so some are small and some are big. But primarily, we'll just focus on the difference in color. It's easy to see. Some of these beetles are green, and some of them are brown. And again, we'll get into the details about how variation arises and what do we understand about variation. But in order to have descent with modification, we have to have some differences. If everybody were the same, 100%, nothing would change. The second thing that we need is heritability. So these traits, like height or hair color or whatnot, in this case, the green versus brown color, these traits have to be heritable. That means that if your parents have a certain trait, you're more likely to have that trait. Make sense? So those are the first sort of conditions that we need for descent with modification. The second thing we need, or the third thing we need, and actually the only other thing that we need, is some constraint on reproduction. So if everybody could reproduce as much as they possibly could, well, we'd be swamped with people, but there would also be no evolution. So there has to be some constraint on reproduction. In this case, we can imagine a predator, this bird, that for some reason or another really likes to eat green beetles. Maybe it can see them better. Maybe they taste better. Who knows? But the bird prefers green over brown beetles. So in this case, the bird eats up the green beetles more than it eats up the brown beetles. And so it constrains the green beetles. They can't reproduce enough. As they can't reproduce as much because they're being eaten. But it, this could also be uh, uh, finite resources, like there's not enough food to support an infinite population, anything like that. Something has to constrain reproduction. And if you have these three things, variation among individuals, heritability, and some constraint on reproduction, you can get descent with modification. So in this scenario here, over time, this bird is going to eat up more of the green beetles. They don't reproduce enough. And because, as, because of heritability, 
the offspring are going to tend to be brown, and they're going to, the, so the brown beetles are going to make up more and more of the population as they go. So, so far we've got life is chemistry plus evolution. The core idea of evolution is descent with modification, trying to explain similarities and differences uh, between organisms. And we need three things to have descent with modification. We have to have variation among individuals, we have to have heritability, and we have to have some constraint on reproduction. Does anybody have any questions or concerns or thoughts so far? OK. So I'm going to play a video, because I like videos, and it will sort of highlight some of these ideas in a specific case study. And this is from HHMI. I didn't... Across the American Southwest, golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here in New Mexico's Valley of Fire, the landscape changes dramatically. Patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruption spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. As the molten rock cooled, it darkened, leaving any creature dependent upon camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles is between seeing and not being seen, the evolutionary game of hide and seek. And we've come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico a battlefield to find one of the tiniest soldiers and what it can teach us about how evolution works. On the desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light-colored fur concealing it from predators. But on dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, attracting the many creatures that see it as food. These mice are the Snickers bar of the desert. They're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes and certainly by owls and maybe even occasionally hawks. And most of those predators are visual predators. You know, we haven't been so what happened to the pocket mice but, you know, that found themselves on this new terrain? And, uh, when, we did this big loss when I accompanied biologist Michael Nachman onto the lava, it doesn't take long to find out. Oh, this one's closed. And it, does it have Nachman has been collecting yeah. mice, unharmed in traps. And it's a dark one. It is, yeah. Now, are uh, most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all is, of them. Not yeah. only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the rock, them into the, bag. the color change has occurred precisely where it will conceal them from hunters. Now, a bit of a white underbelly, too. That's right. All of the dark ones uh, here and on other lava flows have a white underbelly, and presumably there's no selection for dark on the belly because yeah. predators are coming from above. Stomach. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time in the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their background. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? And when a black mouse appears in a light population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a new mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice taken from one desert region. The aim? To find one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. 
mutation seems to mean that something bad has happened. Well, mutations are neither good or bad, whether they are favored or whether they are rejected or whether they're just neutral depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that caused the mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, and it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The light mice are all on the bottom, here, here. Fur color here, is a trait controlled by many genes. To figure out how dark mice evolved, Nachman focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical. But at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC1R. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur, which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How would its dark fur spread to a whole population? This lava flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder is, has there been enough time? It's only been a thousand years. It's a very short period of time for a new mutation to come along and spread and so that all of the mice on this lava flow are black, because really, they all are. Indeed, such a rapid spread of a mutation may seem unlikely, until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black, hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better, and they have more offspring, and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black, as we see today. If dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage, and you start with 1% of the population being dark, then about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, the dark color gives them a 10% advantage, then it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman's mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail. What's exciting about this is that we have a system that's very simple ecologically. You have dark rocks and you have light rocks and you have dark mice and light mice. It, it couldn't be simpler. We know who the predators are, what the selective force is. We know precisely the genetic basis of what makes the mice have an advantage or a disadvantage depending upon where they live. All the pieces are finally together. It's a perfect illustration of Darwin's process of natural selection. In fact, it's more than that, for Nachman's mice also counter a common misconception that evolution is a random process. Well, there is one random component, and that's the process of mutation. Mutations occur at random throughout our DNA. Every new organism is born with a new set of mutations. But while mutation is random, natural selection is not. Natural selection sorts out the winners and losers, and that's really what the whole process of evolution is driven by. But if natural selection is not random, would it produce the same result under the same conditions? It does. And here's proof. Rock pocket mice collected by Nachman from other lava flows in other parts of the Southwest. These are two different black mice, and they each evolved on different lava flows. And the lava flows are hundreds of miles apart. But the changes, the genetic changes that made these mice black uh, were different in each case. And what's amazing to me is how similar the black mice are. We didn't know when we started this whether we would find that there were the same genes or different genes, and, and we were really surprised to find that they were completely different genes, and yet if you look at the mice, they look almost identical. Clearly, there are different genetic ways to make a mouse dark. But once the beneficial mutations appear, natural selection, the non-random part of evolution, can, under very similar conditions, favor very similar adaptations. In effect, each of these lava flows is like rewinding the tape of life and allowing evolution to occur again and again. And in each case, we find that dark mice have evolved.
the rock pocket mice show us that evolution can and does repeat itself, and why evolutionary change is never ending. As environments transform, so must the species that inhabit them, adapting and readapting in the great and complex battle of life. So that was pretty dramatic, but there's a lot of deep sort of evolutionary theory in the video. So I encourage you, you know, if you feel like, watch it again later online. <coughs> but just sort of to conceptualize what they were talking about in that example of the pocket mice, again, we have this pattern of descent with modification. We start with some variation. Now, ultimately, very, we're going to talk about this later on, but ultimately, all variation comes from mutation. Even if there's standing vari variation in a population, if we trace it back, there was some mutation that occurred. And they made a point in the video of talking about mutations being random. So I just wanted to make sure that we understand to what extent mutations are random. Because you'll, you'll see studies that show you know, there are like hyper-variable regions of the genome and things like that. There are certain types of mutations that are more likely to occur than other mutations. So obviously, mutations don't just randomly fall out of the sky onto the genome. There are some parts of the genome that might mutate more than others and stuff like that. But the idea is that mutations are random with respect to outcome. So a mutation doesn't occur in an attempt to solve an evolutionary problem. It's not like that we say, oh, if I change this A to a C, then I'll be able to do this, and it'll allow me to survive, so I'm going to go ahead and change that A to a C. There's no sort of directed way that mutations start to accumulate. And so that's sort of the variation side of thing. Differential reproduction, you know, they made a big point in the video, again, talking about selection pressure. In this case, a predator that prefers one type of prey or can hunt one type of prey more effectively than another. <coughs> and this is what they said is the, the, the not random part of, of the evolutionary process, in that some traits are favored by natural selection and some traits are not favored by natural selection. And this is often sort of couched in the word survival of the fittest. And people will use this term, survival of the fittest, but I'm going to really encourage you not to. Because as we look deeper and deeper into evolutionary processes, we'll see that this term isn't quite as precise as we'd like it to be. And we'll see more of that when we look at the details of natural selection. There are also ways to induce differential reproduction that are random. For example, genetic drift, which we'll talk about later on, is random with respect to variation. It doesn't select certain traits over others. It selects certain individuals over others without considering their underlying traits. And again, we're going to talk in more detail about all of these different things, but I just wanted to, to send them out to you. Um, and then finally, you have to have hered heredity, and in this case, we have genes, which are the mechanisms by which offspring um, inherit the characteristics of their parents, to look like their parents or behave like their parents. And I wanted to just stop here and say that these ideas, everything that we've covered up until this point, is accepted not only by evolutionary biologists and people who, who agree with the evolutionary theory, but nearly all critics of evolutionary theory also would agree with everything that we've talked about from the beginning of the course until now. Um, and I'm going to just divide ev critics of evolutionary theory into two camps. There are ignorant critics, and there are very intelligent or informed critics. And I'm not using the word ignorant to, to like denigrate people. Because you know I'm ignorant of a lot of things as well. I have no idea how a refrigerator works. So I would say I'm ignorant of how a refrigerator works. But basically, the uh, critic from a, a point of view of ignorance is I don't understand something, and I don't believe it. 
right? And that and that's fine as an individual, you know, go do that. Um, but there's really not much you can do with somebody who doesn't understand something and disagrees with it. They're just gonna gonna be ignorant. But there are also a lot of really smart people who really understand evolutionary theory, but don't accept it and don't agree with it. And that's what we're going to sort of focus on. But those critics do understand and accept everything that we've talked about so far, including dissent with modification. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and now think about public opinion and what people, scientists, members of the public believe about evolutionary theory. What's the sort of the social landscape look like? And I'm going to refer to a 2014 survey, um, actually a couple of surveys combined by Pew Research. And this is probably the most recent comprehensive data we have on public opinion. So first I'm, I'm going to look at the question they asked. Have humans evolved over time? And when they asked scientists, 98% of scientists they asked believe that humans have evolved over time. They said yes on the survey. Now these were members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So you know, these were prominent United States scientists primarily. And we'll put this a little bit in context. So this is a, a huge percentage and I'll show you some numbers that I hope will convince you about that. So they asked them other questions too. Questions like is it safe to eat GMOs? 88% of AAS scientists said it's safe to eat GMOs. Should vaccines be required? 86%. Is climate change primarily caused by human activity? 87%. And will growing global population become a problem in the future? 86%. So compared to these questions, which we're going to touch on later on in this course, it's overwhelming how many, the percentage of scientists that believe that humans have evolved over time. When they asked members of the general public, do scientists agree that humans have evolved over time? Only 66% of the public believed that there's a scientific consensus on human evolution, even though the overwhelming majority of scientists agree that human evolution is occurring. And I'll throw one more number out there just because I think it's funny. They asked scientists, does the public know much about science? And 86% of scientists said no. <laughs> the public doesn't, doesn't know much about science. And I, I think it's evident, so you can decide for yourself, but I think it's evident when 98% of scientists agree, in hu uh, 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 agree that humans have evolved, but only 66 of percent of the public think that scientists agree that humans evolved. There's a gap in understanding that, right? So overwhelmingly scientists believe in evolution and in human evolution in particular. Um, what do you think about general public? This is United States, by the way, US data. Any guess? 62. So 62 percent of the general public when they asked, have humans evolved over time, 62% said yes. So there's a big gap between general public belief in evolution and among scientists. And interestingly, we sort of broke this down a, a little bit more, and they said, how many people believe that humans evolved only via natural processes, so strict evolutionists? And 33% of the United States public believes that humans have evolved solely by natural processes. Another 25% believe that they evolved, but that, that evolution was guided in some way by some sort of supreme being or intelligence. And 34% of the general public believe that humans always existed as we are today. So you can take from that whatever you want. Interestingly though, this does seem to break down or stratify by religious affiliation. And you'd kind of expect this, atheists and agnostics are over, overwhelmingly supportive. This is kind of like the definition of an atheist or an agnostic, right? They're, they're more like scientists. <laughs> they're like, yeah, we believe in evolution, whatever. Just leave me alone, I'm gonna go do my humanistic activities. Um, if you look at sort of what they would define as mainstream religion, sort of Catholic, mainstream Protestant, sort of the, the big religions in the United States, 
This is somewhere between 50 and 66 percent of people who identify as members of those religions believe that there is, you know, some evolution of humans. Um, but when you look at um, religions that, or people who identify as Mormons, Evangelical Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses, there's a big decrease again, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of people who identify as members of these groups believe in human evolution. So belief in evolution does stratify somewhat along religious lines and uh, membership to particular religions. So if we sort of crunch these numbers a little bit and we say, what percent of the American public is, are strict believers in the Darwinian evolutionary process applied to humans that we have evolved over time only due to natural processes? There's about 33% of us overall. And the, remain, the, remain, the, the remainder that didn't answer, I don't know, what are you guys talking about, leave me alone, um, either believe that humans have always existed in our present form or that we have evolved under some sort of guidance from an intelligence or a supreme being or something like that. And that's about 60% of Americans. So the overwhelming majority of us believe in some intervention by an intelligent source on our evolutionary history or that we didn't evolve at all, that we were completely created. So that's sort of the social landscape that we're in. And so really, when we look at how do we explain both the similarities and differences among um, organisms, among life, it really comes down to these two competing ideas, evolution and what I'm going to call intelligent design, because that's kind of what it's called today. And this is a quote, I'll, sh I'll show you where the quote comes from later, just so you know I'm not cheating. So evolution is the idea that processes such as natural selection and random mutations are fully capable of producing all of the living systems that we see today. Intelligent design as the alternative says there are at least some features of living systems that are best explained by an intelligent cause. And this comes from Stephen Meyer, the director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Um, I will provide more information on the Discovery Institute later on. Um, this is a group out of Seattle, and it is composed of what I feel are the most kind of intellectual scientific proponents of intelligent design. So these are really smart people who don't believe in ev evolution. Okay? And this is the director of their Institute for Intelligent Design, essentially. And it's, from, it's a little bit old, but it's basically the same ideas are still out there. So back to sort of our original question that evolutionary theory was trying to explain. Why are there so many different kinds of plants and animals, but there are also so many similarities among them? That's what we're trying to answer. And really it comes down to, is evolution sufficient to explain everything that we observe? That's the evolutionary, evolution only. Or do we need something else? Do we need intelligent design to explain some of our observations? Because even people who are strict intellectual intelligent designers still believe in evolution. Like they would have no problem with the pocket mice, they have no problem with uh, antibiotic resistance. Yeah, evolution happens all the time. But there are some things that evolution can explain. And so that's really the controversy. And does anybody have any questions or anything they want to say? Again, we're going to cover, I'll just put this up so that they taping people don't freak out. <laughs> so, um, and we're going to cover all of this kind of stuff in more detail later on, but this is sort of basically where we're going. Good, happy. All right, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the next three weeks and the remainder of the course as well, and we'll see you next week.